Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Pete. Hi, everyone. My name is Eileen, and I'm an alcoholic. And I am a member of the Satellite Beach Group. And I'm very happy to be part of this weekend. I always have felt it to be an honor and a privilege to be associated with anything in AA. And when I'm asked, when I was asked to be part of this 14th order meeting, I was really thrilled, and I want to thank Earl and Al for letting me meet all you people. The first time I heard the preamble read at my first AA meeting, I knew I belonged here. I was a very fortunate woman. I had looked for Alcoholics Anonymous for five years before I found it, although when I looked for it, I didn't know there was a a fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous. I just wanted to stop drinking more than I wanted anything else in my life five years before I found this beautiful program. I was told when I first came into AA, and I've heard many times since at every meeting, that where to, where to tell what it was like, what got us here, and what happened now. And because I've always done what I've been told in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'll tell you about my act of alcoholism. I don't really enjoy talking about it. It's part of the dead past. But maybe there's a newcomer here tonight who hopefully will identify with me. Not with the way I drank or how I drank particularly, but how I felt and what I did to myself before I found this program. My mother and father were both active alcoholics. Uh, they separated when I was 14 months old, and I grew up in a series of foster homes and went back to live with my mother when I was 13 years of age. In about two weeks, I realized that my mother was an alcoholic. Now, I didn't call her that then. I didn't know anything about alcoholism till I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I just knew my mother drank too much. She was always drunk, as far as I was concerned. I never saw her sober. She died drunk. And I hated her. My involvement with her closed my mind. I hated all alcoholics until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was to end up hating myself most of all. But I didn't know all this when I was 13 years old. And I remember I used to pray in much the same way I prayed before I found this program. I would bargain with God. And I remember very seriously praying that if she died, I would give my life to him. I was very ashamed of the way we lived. I had a younger brother. Uh, I had a lot of negative character defects, another thing I didn't know till I got in this program. I was full of resentment at her, felt very sorry for myself, felt very ashamed. And on my graduation from grammar school, when she didn't show up and I went home and saw her drunk with her friends, I got very angry, which was to stay with me for many years got very angry and wondered why people drank alcohol. So I emptied a mayonnaise jar, filled it full of gin, and drank it. And I passed out. When I woke up, I was very sick, and I still remember thinking, people who drink alcohol are crazy. If there was some fun in it, I could see, but uh, they must be crazy. Very soon after that, I started to go to bars with a girlfriend of mine. And at my first date, I had my first drink of alcohol. Now, people talk about whether they were born alcoholics, whether they became alcoholics, when they passed over the line. I was a social drinker for about 20 minutes. 
I loved what that first drink did to me and my personality. I was a very shy, self-conscious, self-centered uh, creep was what I was. Um, I had this drink and immediately I got this beautiful personality change. I became warm and wonderful and loving and pretty and witty. Became the life of the party. I danced on the bar, had a blackout, went in the bathroom and threw up and came out again and really thought I had found the answer to everything. I felt so great that night. The next day when I went to school, this girl who was with me told me that I almost got killed. I crossed the subway tracks. And, you know, I thought, that is a very daring thing to do. I like what happens to me when I drink. And I guess that was the beginning of my insanity, but I didn't know it then. Almost from that point on, really, every chance I got to drink alcohol, I did. And I quickly learned that if anything was happening that I didn't particularly enjoy, if I was tired or I didn't feel like going to school or I had a headache, all I had to do was have a few glasses of beer or a few glasses of wine, and I was fine, and the day was beautiful. And this is the way I went for a couple of years. I got into the habit very quickly of going to bars. I lived in New York, and um, I would go with my girlfriend to these bars and pick up servicemen. I, I was allowed to join a club in high school. It was the National Catholic Community Center for Girls of Good Character. And... Uh, we were warned by the nuns. Our, our job was to uh, show up Friday night. It was a sort of a Catholic USO, serve coffee and donuts to these lonely servicemen and uh, dance with them and under no circumstances uh, get familiar, talk to them, or go out with them. So before the first half of the first dance, I would size up a live one and say, let's go out and have a few drinks. And that's the way my life was at 17 years of age. I was in this bar one night in, in New York City with a sailor I had picked up, as I just described. And I was looking in the, in the bar, in the mirror behind the bar, because I realized even at this age that I knew when I was drunk before anyone else knew I was drunk. My right eye used to cross. So I looked in the mirror to see if my right eye was crossed. And if it was, my next step was to go in the bathroom, throw up, and come back, come back again. Well, as I looked in the mirror, this big, beautiful Marine walked into the bar. He was six foot tall. He had on an overseas cap, very tan. Uh, he was just the greatest thing I'd ever seen in my whole life. So he was playing the jukebox, and I went over to him to tell him what song I would like to hear played. And he said, get rid of Sonny Boy, and we'll go out. So I got rid of the sailor and went out with the Marine, and we got married. <laughs> we both drank rum and Coca-Cola, and we both smoked Chesterfield cigarettes, so that was a good reason to get married. <laughs> we were married April Fool's Day. I have to bring that out. He still says to our son, stay away from bars, that's where I met your mother. Uh, but he really never saw me at my worst then. And uh, he was stationed in North Carolina in Cherry Point, and I was in New York. So he only came up every other weekend, and I went around about my merry way, still going to the National Catholic Community Center and picking up servicemen and drinking and he surprised me. He came home a week before our wedding, and I was very drunk. And he said, I think we should call this marriage off. And I asked him why. And he said he didn't want the mother of his children to be a drunk. That he didn't like drunken women. And I said, I didn't like drunken women either. I thought they were the lowest things on earth. I really meant that too and I didn't consider myself a drunken woman I told him I was very excited about our impending wedding and this would never happen again and we were married and we weren't on a honeymoon five days and he said Eileen you drink more than any girl I ever met and by the tenth day he said you drink more than any man I ever met <laughs> 
And I was very angry. Anger was to play a big part in my act of alcoholism. And I reminded him that he didn't meet me in the flower shop. He met me in the bar. <laughs> and it wasn't very pleasant. Um, I don't know if I was an alcoholic in those days. I just knew I loved to drink and what I loved what happened to me when I drank alcohol. And yet, even then, when I drank, this personality change wasn't enhancing me in any way. I soon became very nasty and very bitter and very arrogant, and I constantly looked for, for a fight so he would go out. I had a lovely little boy and another lovely little boy. They were... They, they were born perfectly normal, for which I'm, I've been inter eternally grateful. And my husband stayed in the Marine Corps, and we lived in Vero Beach, Florida. And he would go out and fly his planes, and I would buy a bottle of wine and take care of these two little boys. He became a New York City policeman, and he made $35 a week. And I couldn't drink on $35 a week. I, I knew that then. And we had many fights about the way I spent money. I mean, he would give me his pay on a Friday night, and Saturday noon it was gone. So I started these two little boys in a modeling and television career, and they made out quite well. Uh, I was in New York City. We didn't live right in the city. I was in New York City nearly every day with these kids. One of them was uh, a little over three, and one of them was 22 months old. And... Um, one of them would have a, a job in a, in a photography studio, and another one would be doing a commercial on the other side of town. And I would be in the bar in Midtown so I could get to one or, or the other when they were finished their jobs. And invariably I got drunk, and I would go home without them because now I know I was in a blackout and I couldn't remember where I'd left them. My husband threatened to put me, to report me to the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, and to put me in a mental institution. And you know, I wasn't 23 years old, and I didn't care. I was so sick, and so ashamed, and so remorseful. I knew I wasn't drinking right, and yet I didn't know a person, an alcoholic, who didn't drink, till I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I knew there were people like my mother, who drank too much, I knew there were people like my husband who drank socially, and I knew there were people who didn't drink at all, but I didn't know that there were alcoholics who didn't drink, and I really didn't know what to do except to cry all the time. My mother and I got very friendly when I started to drink heavily. We used to go to the bar, the two of us, any bar, and stay till it closed at three in the morning, and she would put me in a hospital and I would have induced labor, and my baby would be born at 10 o'clock, and she'd be in with uh, Brandy Alexander's and beer in an hour. I knew about the compulsion to drink alcohol. I knew I was a sick lady. And all I can plead now is ignorance. I wanted to die, and I couldn't die. I saw nothing to live for, and I had two beautiful little boys and a husband who at that time loved me very much, and he couldn't understand me. And I would promise to stop drinking, and we would fight, and anyone who lives with an alcoholic really knows all the, all the details that go on when, when an alcoholic is actively drinking. It, it was very sad, and I didn't know what to do. And then one day on a June 30th, I got a big, fat $5,000 residual check from my oldest boy's commercial. And my husband was working, and I decided I was going to throw a party that was to end all parties. And it was a very hot day, and I decided we'd have a bathing suit party. And I lived in a tenement that was really from the pits. And I decided I'd have a beach party, and everyone should bring umbrellas up on the roof, and we were really going to have a time. And I bought a lot of, ordered a lot of booze, and we all went up in bathing suits, and... About 12 o'clock, some woman came up, and she said to me, you better put on some clothes, something's happened. And I remember being very angry, but I did, and I went downstairs, and I met a man, and I said, what happened? And he said, a little boy's been hit by a truck. And I said, is he dead? And he said, yes. And I knew it was my oldest son, 
And I only remember that day now because uh, I felt no emotion, no God-given emotion that I was to luckily feel later when I got into this program. There was no grief or sorrow or a sense of loss at that moment. I was full of fear, and I still remember the fear I had that day, that when my husband found out about this, he would kill me. And he didn't. And after the funeral, we had a very serious talk about my drinking. And he st he had stopped calling me names and stopped threatening what he was going to do to me. And he said to me, don't you think you hurt yourself enough? And don't you think you hurt me enough? And don't you think you hurt the child you're carrying enough that you will stop drinking? What do you need to happen to make, to make you stop drinking? And I was so elated that he wasn't punishing me, that I promised him I would never drink again, that I had learned my lesson, and I was not going to drink, and God was good, and we were very young, and we could have a family, and on and on and on, and I was lying and lying, because this is the time that I can, I know I was an alcoholic. I just couldn't live in reality. I couldn't accept what happened to me. I have learned since that there are people in life, everyone in life, let's face it, has some tragedy. And, and the, the wise ones, the spiritual ones, look for a power outside themselves, look for some strength. Not, no, I was a very defiant, arrogant, uh, sick woman. And as I was promising him I would never drink again as long as I live, I was making a vow to myself, Mr., you haven't seen anything yet. I'll never be sober the longest day I live, because I don't want to live anymore, because I can't take this pain, and I can't take this guilt, and I can't take this shame. And I couldn't. And I drank then from that day until I found Alcoholics Anonymous, just for complete oblivion as quickly as I could. And I think if someone ever said to me, have another drink and it'll kill you, I would have drunk it because I didn't want to live. I didn't know how spiritually sick I was and how hateful and defiant I was and what an egomaniac I was. I found all this about myself in Alcoholics Anonymous. The Korean War was on. My husband was recalled into the Marine Corps because he was in the reserves. The people in New York City stopped calling my children. Now I had a a boy and a girl uh, to do modeling jobs or television jobs. They would say, you know, we'll use the kids, but let the mother stay home. And for a while I had a very nice, respectable, middle-aged German woman bring them to the city, and she got sick of my antics. So at the time my husband went back into the Marine Corps, I was living with three children. I had another little girl. Sometimes I'm very grateful that I don't remember the details and the, uh, the horrors of those couple of years. Anyway, he went back to North Carolina and I was in New York and I had no money. And my children weren't working anymore. And my husband wasn't sending me money. So I gradually started to sell the furniture. And when he came home one day, a few years before I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was lying on the floor much like this with my two little girls and one little boy. Drunk. And there wasn't a stick of furniture in the house. And he took me to North Carolina and he said, nobody here knows you're a drunk. And it wasn't very nice because neither of us knew what he was talking about. And I didn't make promises anymore. And we went to North Carolina. And we stayed there for a couple of years. And then we came back to New York. In New York, we lived in a suburb that was called Staten Island. It was very rural. It was about 1956. And there were uh, very little, very little transportation. And I didn't have a car. And I had some beer men there, and they were beautiful. They used to deliver beer to me morning, noon, and night, or any time my husband wasn't home. In fact, when I when I moved to where I, I lived right before I came here, I was in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had a christening for a baby I had after I came into AA, who has never seen me drunk. 
and I had the godparents from this little town out in Staten Island. And I remember at the uh, christening to make conversation, I said to the godfather, how's everything out in Staten Island? And he said, the beer men still cry when they pass your house. <laughs> Well, we lived there for a few months, and uh, I said in my usual arrogant way, we have to move away from here. Uh, Billy is getting big enough to model and to go to New York City by himself, and he has to make enough money for college. And I told my husband to find a place near a train. That's all I knew. I had to be near a train. Right before this, um, some man had called me from, from New York City and said, had seen a picture of my older daughter who was four and said, we'd, we'd like to have your little girl in the Miss Blue Bonnet contest. We're having a nationwide contest for a little girl that looks most like Miss Blue Bonnet. And we picked four little girls and we'd like to know if you'd let her attend and, uh, be part of it. And I said, I sure would. And they said, well, before we allow her to enter the contest, we have to tell you that her picture will be on the Railway Express trucks and in all the blue bonnet packages, and uh, we have to investigate the family. And I didn't want this to happen. And I said, why do you have to investigate the family? And he said, well, if the father of one of these kids turns out to be a drug addict, a communist, a jailbird, or an alcoholic... Uh, she wouldn't be allowed to enter because that might get out and that might spoil our image. And I tried to talk him out of this investigation. I told him my husband was a respectful, respectable policeman and was not a drug addict, communist, a jailbird, or an alcoholic. But he said, we have to investigate you anyway. So I made up some story, and I said we were living with my mother-in-law between houses, and they investigated over there, and I wasn't there, and she was allowed to enter. She eventually won that contest. And I remember bits and pieces my husband saying that morning when we were to meet the mayor and the, the borough president, you're not going to get drunk today. And I was drunk already. And we went to this lovely luncheon and uh, got a $5,000 check and a plaque that said typical American family, and I was drunk. So the time came a few months later. My husband found a, a little town near a train so my oldest son could go to the city by himself and make enough money to go to college. And I was drinking around the clock. And we had some terrible fights. And I was neither a wife, nor a mother, nor a daughter, nor a sister. I wasn't even feminine. I, I didn't even feel like a human being. And all I did was cry and drink and drink and cry. And one day, a day that will probably turn out to be the happiest day in my life, it has been so far, on May 30th, 1957, I didn't have anything to drink in the house except beer. And beer was just to put the fire out. I didn't drink beer. And there was no alcohol. And I said to my husband, I'm going to go and get something to drink. Now, I was in my early 20s, and I looked 50, and I was 50 pounds overweight, and I had wine sores all over my face, and I smelled like a sewer, and I don't know when I had bathed. And my husband naturally didn't answer me, and I had on a dirty old bathrobe of his and his slippers, and I put on an overcoat, and I walked down to the local package store. And there was a sign on the door, closed 1 o'clock Memorial Day. And it was about 10 after 1. And I went into my act of kicking the door and rattling the knob, and some nice policeman came over and said, What are you doing, lady? And I said, I want to get something to drink. And I don't understand liquor stores that are closed on holidays. Where I come from, we're open 24 hours a day. And if you're not careful, I'll move back. And he took me home. He asked me where I lived. He got my husband, and he said, Keep her in the house. And I was in a rage, and I went to the refrigerator, and I opened it, and I took some beer, and I went up to my bedroom and slammed the door and started to drink. And in my bedroom, 
on the floor, there were a bunch of newspapers. And I picked one up, and I was looking at it, and there was a column in it called the counselor's column. And it said, my husband has a drinking problem. Is there anywhere he can go for help? And the answer was a telephone number. And I looked at that number, and I drank my beer, and I finished my beer, and I went down for more beer, and I came back, and I just sat there all afternoon, sipping on this beer, getting angry and crying and passing out. And I woke up some time, and I called the number. And some man answered, and I said, do you help people who st want to stop drinking? He said, yeah, lady, come around tonight at 8.30. I said, are you sure you're open? Today's a holiday. <laughs> and he said, we're open. You've just come around. He didn't mention Alcoholics Anonymous. He just told me where to come. So eventually I went downstairs and I said to my husband, will you take me someplace tonight where they'll help me stop drinking? He said, okay. So I had on the bathrobe already. I just put on the coat. And the slippers. And he brought me over to a church that looked much like this and a thousand places I've been in since. And parked the car. I said, come on, let's go. He said, not me. You will have the problem. And I didn't want to go in. I was afraid. And he wouldn't let me back in the car. So I walked into what turned out to be my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thought he left me in the wrong church because I saw all people like you laughing and, and throwing their arms around each other and kissing each other. And I thought, that idiot, I don't belong here. But I didn't get up and leave. I sat in the last row in the last seat. And three sober alcoholics got up, just like Eddie and Pete and Judy did tonight and, and like we do at every meeting. And someone read the preamble. And when I heard... Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. I just couldn't believe it. And I didn't want to go home. And after I heard these three sober alcoholics speak, I thought one of them would take me home and let me live with him for a year. And when he taught me how not to drink, then I'd be let free and I'd be fine for the rest of my life. And nobody did that. And I didn't know I didn't know what to do when the meeting was over. And I started to walk out the door and thank God for the lovely young woman that came over and said, Hi, how are you? Is this your first meeting? And I said, How do you know it's my first meeting? <laughs> but you know, you you're all so kind to newcomers. So kind. And I cried, and I said, how do I get to be like you people? And she said, when did you have your last drink? And I said, I don't know, about 8 o'clock tonight. Why? And she said, well, it's 10 o'clock now. You have two hours of sobriety. You have 22 more hours to go, and you'll have a day sober. I said, so? She said, if you can do that, you'll never have to get sober again, and you'll never have to hurt like this anymore. And put a value on your sobriety. If you, if any alcoholic that has one day sobriety has got it made, do you think you can do it? And because she was so nice to me, I said, I think I can do it. She said, good, then do it. I went outside and I said to my husband, I don't have to drink anymore. He said, I've been telling you that for eight years. <laughs> I said, you should have come inside with me, though. You should have met those people. They're beautiful. They're different. You'd love them. They're just like me. <laughs> he said, all I need right now is a room full just like you. <laughs> we went home. I almost had another beer. And I thought, it's 11 o'clock, I have three hours of sobriety, I have 21 more hours to go, and I'm going to do it because I promised Alice I was going to do it. And she told me it would probably be the worst day that I ever lived. 
and she told me that if I was successful in not picking up my next first drink for three days, that the alcohol would be out of my system, and I'd never again, as long as I lived, have a physical compulsion to drink, unless I were insane enough to put alcohol back into my system again, and then the compulsion would start. And in subsequent meetings, she explained the difference between compulsion and obsession, and she told me about alcoholism being a threefold disease, and she said anyone can walk into these rooms with the love and acceptance they get and, and, and stop drinking, because any fool can do that. And you start to feel better almost immediately. You're supposed to feel better when you have no poison in your system. But alcoholism is a threefold disease. And when you're physically sober, you're one-third a person. And if you want to recover mentally and spiritually, it would be very good for you to attend meetings and to put this program into your life. And I didn't want to hear that. And I didn't want to hear the word sponsor. And I didn't want to hear anything about the steps. Alice explained to me after physical sobriety came mental sobriety. And after I were in Alcoholics Anonymous for a while, that I would put in a day that wasn't completely beautiful, that might be full of negative thinking and negative actions, and all these character defects of which she knew like self-pity and resentment and hate might come up, and if I didn't think of a drink to alleviate the emotional pain, then I was well on my way to being mentally sober. And then, she said, if you are particularly fortunate and you keep coming to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, you may get spiritually sober. You may. And she said, I can promise you a life if you have spiritual sobriety that is indescribable. It is so happy, joyous, and free. And I listened to Alice because I respected her, but I really didn't believe her. And I wouldn't choose a sponsor, and I wouldn't exchange my telephone number with anybody because I loved all of you as a group, but I didn't want you to get to know me because once any of you got to know me, then you might not like me, and I had to be liked. It was very important that you like me, so I didn't want to get close to you. But I came to meetings. The only thing I did right for one full year was not pick up that drink and attend AA meetings. I remember closed meetings when a subject would be discussed like humility or honesty or tolerance or especially love. I would feel my heart pounding inside, and I, I would go into a rage, and I remember saying at one meeting, what has love got to do with sobriety? I don't understand you people. I just want to hear how to keep the cork in the bottle. I don't want to hear how I have to love. And one very wise alcoholic said, why don't you keep quiet? <laughs> And why don't you try to help another alcoholic help himself, and maybe you'll find out what love is all about. So I kept quiet. But I didn't talk, and I didn't ask anybody's advice, but I came to meetings. And one day when I was home, I was cleaning the refrigerator, and I opened it, and there were two cans of beer there, ice cold beer. And I thought, uh, it's probably true. I take my next first drink, the compulsion will set up, but it won't set up immediately. And it was hot. So I took the two beers out and closed the door and opened them. And right then there was a knock on the door, and I answered it. And these two burly laborers were doing somebody else's lawn work. And one of them said, hey, lady, you wouldn't have a cold beer, would you? I thought, my God, they have spies. <laughs> And I didn't tell anybody. I just gave these men the beer, and I went about my business. And then about a month later, I woke up with the most terrific obsession to drink that I have ever lived through. And I didn't know what to do. I did not have one telephone number. I got friendly with nobody. I would come to a meeting as the preamble was being read and be out the door before the Amen and the Our Father. 
And I was shaking and sweating, and I could almost taste this alcohol. I was in a bad state, and I, I realized that this is an obsession to drink, and what in the name of God do I do? And I went downstairs, and I poured some gin into a glass, and back in the bottle, and back in the glass, and back in the bottle. And then I remembered all those meetings with all you people talking to me about obsessions and about the steps and about getting to be part of AA instead of fooling around and being a guest visitor and, and getting all the benefits without any of the work. And I prayed as I was only taught to pray before I learned to pray. And I got down on my hands and knees and in my arrogance I said, if there is a God, Take this obsession to drink away, and I'll do what they tell me. I'll get into the steps, and I'll try to help people. And the obsession left, and it never again returned. And that was the day when I considered myself a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, because that was the day my mind started to open up to what you people had been trying to tell me for five or six months that this is a spiritual program. And if I want to be healthy, I better recover in three ways. And if I want to have continuous sobriety a day at a time, and if I want to have all the joy and the happiness and freedom that is promised alcoholics in Alcoholics Anonymous, then I better get to work. And it was told to me that sobriety is a gift, but I better use this gift or I'd lose it. And that was the day that I really became a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that was the day my life and I started to change. I have yet to meet a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous who hasn't had a complete personality change for the better in working the steps. I knew I was powerless over alcohol long before I came into AA. I'd have to be a fool not to know that. I knew I wasn't restored to sanity because I had that obsession to drink. And any alcoholic, in my opinion, who has an obsession to drink once he or she is sober, hasn't been restored to sanity. And then I was told that all I had to do was make a decision to turn my life and will over to the care of God. I didn't even have to believe in God. Once I started to believe in Him and become aware of Him, then the decision had already been made, and I was through with that. And I was told about if I ever picked up my next first drink, it wouldn't be a compulsion to do so. It would be those contributory factors to my alcoholism, my character defects. And I was told, and everything I was told I did as soon as I was told to do it. There were no suggestions. I was told to write a fourth step, to write an autobiography of my life and then to share it with someone who pointed out to me that my main character defect was fear. And all my dishonesties and all my deceits and all my con jobs and all my lies were caused by fear. That fear was the grandfather of all my shortcomings. That if I got up every morning and humbly asked God to remove these shortcomings for the day, just as I asked him to re to keep me from taking my next first drink, that they would be removed, and they are removed for the day. And I made the list, and I make amends. I happen to think that the 12 steps are one great amend, broken down into 12 parts. And I hope I live the rest of my life making amends. And yet, what you have taught me in this program the way to live and the way to behave. I don't have anyone else on that list. And I don't want to put anyone else on that list. Because I haven't got time to have any more people to put on that list. And if the day isn't particularly wonderful, I do a spot check and I know when I'm wrong. I know when I'm less than kind and less than thoughtful. I don't have any trouble anymore with human relationships. That's all behind me. And the only reason I went through these steps 
is so I would have the spiritual awakening. Because everything you people in AA promised would happen to me, happened to me. And when I read through those steps and I saw that step 12 that says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, I wanted it. It didn't say maybe you'd have it. And it didn't say 20% of you will have it. It just said we'd have it. And for that reason alone was good enough for me. And I have the 12 steps in my life today to the best of my ability. And it keeps changing. Every day is different. You know, when I was drinking, I don't know how it is with you, every single day was the same. I was either drunk, more drunk, or less drunk. And today, I have a joyous expectancy of the best. You taught me that. I discovered that here. I have a life that Alice told me was indescribable, and I find it hard to describe it to you. Any more than any of us can really describe the pain and the shame of our act of alcoholism. I have five children that I think are wonderful. They are gifts. I am so proud of them, and they love me so much. I have a husband who tolerates me, tolerates me more when he's in New York and I'm in Florida. Uh, I have his respect now. I have all those goodies that I know my creator meant for me to have when he gave me life. But I didn't understand it till I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And now I have birthdays. And I had 24 years, May 30th. And I have a boy that's my baby, six foot one. He never saw me drunk. He won a scholarship, a basketball scholarship to college. They're all on their way. They all have great jobs. They're all social drinkers. And they think I'm the greatest. And they are so grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous because they go in bars. And my youngest son just told me a few weeks ago, he met a woman in a bar. He said, oh, I got such chills when I looked at her. She looked just like you. Oh, when you were young, I guess, but she looked just like you. He said, I was so ashamed. I felt so sorry for that lady. She kept falling off the bar stool. Did you do that, Mom? I said, I really don't remember. <laughs> That's ancient history. I have a son out in California. He sent me a birthday card. And it said, when I think of all the things that would have never been, if you had never been, I celebrate the day you were born. So he doesn't remember my drinking. And the little boy who died never saw me sober. But that's part of my past. I hope there's a newcomer in the room tonight. I hope there's a newcomer that's a week away from a drink or a day away from a drink or one hour away from a drink. Because I know just how you feel. And I still identify with newcomers. And it doesn't make any difference whether you've been drinking for three years or 50 years. I know what you're going through because everyone in this room who is an alcoholic Hours of despair and days of loneliness. And that's what you're going through if you're still drinking or you're newly sober. And welcome. Because everybody here loves you. And nobody here is going to ask you questions or embarrass you. And if you come join us in a very short time, you're going to experience what sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous who live this beautiful, perfect program of AA experience. And it's not five years sobriety or 30 years sobriety. It's seconds of exhilaration and moments of joy and minutes of serenity and hours of peace of mind and days of contentment and an indescribably adventurous, joyful life with blessings and fun and pleasure and happiness it's a not grit your teeth and stay sober. It's thank God I'm sober and thank God for the people in AA.
Thank God you were here when I needed you. And I need you more now than I needed you my first week in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because if I pick up my next first drink, I know I'll never get sober again. I just know I won't. And I have too much to lose. I have too much to throw away. And I have seen too many people. You see, if you have a slip when you first come in, it's very sad. But you usually get right back in again. If you have a slip, or I have a slip, after many years of sobriety, it is tragic. Because very few people with many years of glorious sobriety who pick up the next first drink ever have the humility to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous again. And this is why people who are in for many, many years are so needful of this program. So the complacency doesn't set in. So the spiritual pride doesn't set in. So people like me are constantly reminded that they have to remain teachable, that I could know everything there is to know about alcoholism, that I could know the big book backwards and frontwards, and I could know the 12 steps and the 12 traditions, and nothing will keep me from picking up my next first drink. None of that intelligence. Your wisdom and your love and your understanding for me as another alcoholic and your sharing with me as you did this weekend keeps me from picking up my next first drink. I want to thank you so much again for letting me be part of this beautiful weekend and for having the privilege of meeting all you people. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.